Welcome everyone, Kostim here with my campaign overview guide for one of the more powerful legendary lords in the game, or at least one that has one of the easiest campaign starts in the entire game and grows stronger as the campaign goes by. And that is, of course, Ark in the Black for the Tomb Kings. Now, the Tomb Kings are a race that grows stronger as you play the campaign, as you unlock more unit types, more powerful units, and since they have free recruitment, uh, and no upkeep, it can become an unstoppable snowball, assuming you get off the ground. But this is where Arkan comes in. He has several campaign benefits that make him immensely powerful from turn one of his campaign. For starters, he starts with two regions, and he also starts with the Grave Hill, which gives him an incredible amount of unit capacity for Crypt Golds, Direwolves, and Felbats. Now, these units are not the best units, but they're certainly better than Skeletal Warriors or Skeletal Spearmen. At tier 3, you can also get Hex Wraiths for it, though it's only one capacity, though Hex Wraiths are pretty decent units in their own right. And since it's a tier 2 building, you can right off the bat start getting open graves to get access to Nehekaran Warriors. So that's one of the first advantages. And by the way, this building over here, when we're looking at this particular building uh, that he can uh, he can construct, he can put it in any settlement. You can construct it in any settlement and get an absolutely ridiculous amount of grip goals, direwolves, and fell bats. And Arkham himself will also buff those units by quite a decent amount in his campaign for all of his armies, if I'm not mistaken. Faction-wide benefits, you get that specific recruitment of those units because you have the Book of Nagash that allows you to do it. You suffer in terms of diplomatic relations with Tomb Kings, which doesn't matter because you don't really care about diplomacy with other Tomb Kings as any of the Tomb Kings, uh, Tomb King Legendary Lords. Maybe to an extent, etc. with Kalida, but even then it's only to an extent. You do, however, get significant diplomatic relations uh, benefits to uh, with Vampire Coast and Vampire Count. So you can make uh, deals with Lufer Harkon over here, like you can get the trade agreement really early on in your campaign and start earning income. You can also make deals with Manfred if you so desire, but here's the thing. You're going to need uh, to capture his territory in order to win the campaign. So, uh, making an alliance with Manfred kind of flies in the face. Like, it's so annoying when you're playing the Tomb Kings because you actually want the territories of people who could be prospective allies. Like Manfred. Though, screw Manfred, anyway. That's the fa Those are the faction-wide benefits. With one very significant one, and by far away one of the most significant campaign benefits for probably any Legendary Lords... Uh, at least early on. Later on, not so important, but early on, this is a game changer. One extra army capacity. So what you can do, and what you should do, turn one, as Arkan, is do this. Take your lovely army over here, and uh, wipe out this entire army. Easy replenishment, easy on to resolve, and then uh, uh, take their settlement over here. This is on Legendary, by the way. I have an entire province, though granted, two of them are with ports, so I'm not really necessarily going to feel the benefits. And then I can get, you know, all those units, all those lovely, lovely units, and you can just get another Lord. The trust or the effect is pretty, pretty good. Five diplomatic relations with all faction. And you can then start recruiting units for a second army from turn one. And then once you've gotten a decent number of units in two armies, you just hop on over here and smash Rapons, take the Strigoi out, take the Dwarves out if you feel like it, or even vassalize the Dwarves. You don't necessarily need to wipe out the Dwarves. You could just take the Great Desert of Araby, trade it with them, uh, take my trick and give it to the Dwarves, actually, before you deal with Rapons, then go deal with Rapons. But before I go into campaign plans in a greater detail, let's talk about Arkan himself, what he has to offer. So, his special skill line, he gets casualty replenishment, local recruitment capacity, and missile strength plus 15% for Casket of Souls, which are incredibly potent artillery units. 
but you do need to own 20 units to be able to unlock that. Byroy, incredibly potent, and you should, every time you can get a cask of the souls, like that one, once that 15 uh, turn uh, cooldown expires, you should always use it. Ideally, while at the same time recruiting a lord. Uh, then he can get uh, Vengeful, so he's getting a decent enough uh, ability, Curse of Death and Death. But really, which gives him even more casualty replenishment, so you're looking at 15% casualty replenishment. That means you can easily recover, go battle to battle to battle and easily recover from that, even when you take extreme casualties. Furthermore, he gets melee attack for Felbats and Crypt Goals, faction wide. Charge bonus for Dial Rolls and Hex Wraiths. Faction wide. He gets hero capacity for Lich Priest and hero recruit rank for Lich Priest. And then he also gets a plus free uh, recruit rank for Felbats, Darwell, Script Goals, and Hex Wraiths. Faction wide. He is pretty strong in battle. Like Cetra is better from a pure melee perspective, far better. Arkhan just gives you, uh, gives you some significant faction wide uh, benefits that mash well together with that uh, with the bonuses he has from that extra army capacity and that army capacity is ridiculously powerful one of the big problems the tomb kings have is just getting their feet off the ground you start with two armies you're gonna have a leisurely early game and that like if you're looking for a campaign where you don't have to stress out over the early game you can enjoy it have fun you know just dominate the map this might be the campaign for you if you want to play the tomb kings uh, then there's the books of nagash and this can play well in the books in Magash. You might have to start a campaign several times over. Like, for instance, uh, the fifth book, the one that you want the most because it gives you that awesome army capacity and unit capacity for those units, which is pretty damn good. Uh, you want the fifth book to be close to you, either in, in the jungle over here or in this rogue army. Since you have two armies, you should be able to just auto-resolve that by bringing two armies or fight them manually, though it is a pretty hard battle. Um, when it comes to it. Like, the books are randomized whenever you start the campaign too close. Like, you would want one that would be close enough. Though, to be, for, uh, to be fair, the fourth book of Nagash is pretty decent in its own right. Okay. But here's the benefit of Arkhan starting with the one extra army capacity and potentially getting an extra one on top of that through the book. He has a he can do so like so can Cetra, so can Kalida. That's not necessarily the problem. But he will have three armies. They'll have two at most if you're playing them. Another benefit of that is you can just start uh, researching a dynasty. Like say for instance, I would uh, generally start with the first dynasty. Uh, get it close uh, to completion and then start researching the fourth. And since you can get free armies pretty quickly in a campaign as Arkhan, you might even do free dynasties close to completion before you're going, uh, before you're actually finished. So, like, do this 15 turns, uh, do, uh, do the fourth, uh, well, 14 turns, do the fourth, 14 more turns, all that. And suddenly, once it's all done, once you've, uh, once, uh, once, what, what is it, like close to 45 turns, uh, or rather 30, 42 turns have expired, you'll suddenly get free extra armies on top of the free that you can get pretty early on for the Book of Nagash and the one you, uh, on top of the one you start with, of course. So, and that means at that point you just become a steamroll that sweeps aside any kind of resistance. You will probably be using a lot of skeletal uh, warriors at that point, but it is a substantial amount of power. Uh, by the way, one thing to mention about Arkhan is he does have the Staff of Nagash, which gives him 10% uh, research rate, which can be pretty uh, good when you're the uh, when you want to get uh, when you're dealing with the Tomb King's research. Most of the research that Tomb King's does have is pretty fast; like it only takes like two turns. But like every dynasty is like minus 30% research rate. It's gonna add up pretty quickly once you start doing it. So just be aware of that. Uh, the best dynasties, the first dynasty is great because you can get the nec Necrotect for gold as opposed to Canopic Jars. You don't want to spend Canopic Jars on your hero capacity early on in the campaign. For most of the Tomb Kings, though, as Archon, since you can get so much army capacity, you might not even need to worry about saving enough Canopic Jars for a new dynasty here, and you could spend it on increasing hero capacity. Though, generally, I would go with research first, like max out the research before starting to use Canopic Jars to unlock for the mortuary cult anything okay so what's your campaign plan well turn one 
take this province, just match resolve everything. Uh, after that, spend a couple of turns building up a force, then just, or just wait one turn, get the full, uh, get uh, some units over here, and then just go from a trek, because that can improve your diplomatic relations with dwarves, and then just go on and head to smash Rapunz, take Kofor, take Alahik, uh, take uh, Fyrus, make some deals with the dwarves, take Zendri, uh, take this entire territory. And then finish it off by taking the Great Desert of Araby. Whether or not you choose to fight the rogue army, when you choose to fight the rogue army, that's up to you. After that, bear in mind you do start a war with Cetra, but Cetra is going to have some problems. He is going to be incredibly limited. You'll have two armies, maybe even three if you take out this rogue army. He's only going to have one for the, fir uh, for the first uh, 15 turns of his campaign. Just bury him in skeletons. Uh, take the Black Pyramid, take out Volkmar, take out Manfred, conquer the entirety of Camry within I know, 30 turns, maybe even less, maybe 20 turns you can conquer the entirety of Camry, and no one really has the capacity of resisting you. Now, here's the great thing about uh, Arkhan's campaign. You can colonize uh, the wasteland very effectively, like though you can't colonize the, the mountains. Nor can you colonize the jungle. It's a similar situation with Cetra, though. Uh, you will want to wipe out Kalida, though. Because you need to wipe out Kalida for the sake of the short campaign victory in the condition for a 15% casualty replenishment, which stacks with the one that you can already get on Arkhan, so it's a biblical amount. So you can move on, conquer the entirety of the Badlands, then go into the Darklands. The problem with the Tomb Kings in their campaign is that, yes, they have some great starting regions, but the amount of territory they can conquer after that is uh, pretty limited. Like, you might want to head over to southern Lustria, like, help Lufar Harkon deal with the Lizardmen el and High Elves that he's going to be dealing with in the campaign, make an alliance with him, conquer uh, Lustria with him. Um, but, like, once you've taken the desert, you are going to find yourself in a position where expanding your territory is going to be, uh, is going to prove to be a bit difficult. And the Badlands is always a bit painful to deal with, like, Scarbrand is an issue, Queek is an issue, Warzag is an issue. But just remember, you're the most powerful faction in the area, by far and away. I mean, Scarbrand might beat you in a one-on-one -on -one fight. Bring free armies to beat Scarbrand. Pretty simple. Or snipe him using using the Chosen of the Gods, uh, who shop the regiment around. They'll literally annihilate him. The great thing, by the way, uh, like, the great thing is you, you do have, like, some really good regiments right now as, uh, as the Tomb Kings that are available. I would say Arkhan isn't as good in the late game as Cetra is, but Cetra's early game is genuine mystery. And I think Arkhan's campaign is the better of the two, because a campaign where the early game is misery and everything past that is a cakewalk, which is certainly the case with Cetra, is not fun. You could argue Arkhan's campaign is very much a cakewalk, but Cetra's campaign benefits really suit the late game much better. Work, uh, work very well in that late game. Because at one point, just the extra armies are not going to matter as much. That extra army capacity you start with is not going to matter as much. And Cetra's construction time will matter a significant amount when it comes to expanding your empire. So Cetra has some ben some major benefits, but he has a really rough early game. Uh, whereas Arkhan has a very easy early game. And honestly, steamrolls the map from turn one. Uh, but he's not as strong in the late game uh, as Cetra is. Of course, you're signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and I'll see you boys and girls next time.